This morning's reading is Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else, for each one should carry his own load. Thank you very much, Margaret. Continuing our series, One Another series. This sermon is called Bear One Another's Burdens. But before we get into it, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together around your word. We pray, God, that you would bless this message to our hearing, to our understanding, that we might not just hear, but also understand and apply to our lives. May we be like the builders who build on the, on the rock and not on the sandy soil. Oh, Father, we pray that you might continue to form and transform us into the image of Christ. Help us to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I have this bad habit um, that I'm going to share with you this morning. Uh, it's a bit of therapy sometimes, preaching, and I have this bad habit. Maybe you have it too. And it's this bad habit of doing things on my own when it might not be wise or a good idea to do so. All right, why do I do that? Why do I sometimes I just go all this effort and if I just asked for help if i just asked someone to help me out it would have been so much easier why do i do that why do i sometimes go to all this effort and do everything myself well i was talking to a friend uh one day and he said something that really caught just struck me Uh, he was saying that a lack of delegation in a leader is a sign of laziness I thought, what, what on earth are you talking about? What is delegate, not delegating, not asking other people to help? Why is that a sign of laziness? And he said, well, it's because uh, it has had a bit of effort sometimes to explain the task to somebody else, uh, to give over control to someone else, and it might not be done the way that you want it, but you have to trust someone. You have to explain it. You have to go to a bit of effort. And so it can be laziness to do everything yourself. Now, that's a reason to not ask for help, right? Uh, it's possible that just can't be bothered explaining the task and it's just easier to do it myself. But there's another reason. There's another reason that I might do things myself and not ask for help. is because there is a streak of self-reliance in me and self-exaltation. Self-reliance and self-exaltation. What do I mean? What do I mean? Part of me doesn't want to rely on other people. If you don't rely on anybody else, then you can't be disappointed. But the other side, and perhaps the worst side of it, is that there is a part of me, sometimes, that enjoys being relied upon. I remember uh, back in my days at DHHS, uh, working for the Department of Health, and I'd go on holiday for a couple of weeks, and I'd come back and, be like, and I'd say, how did things go while I was away? And they'd be like, it was fine. Everything went well. There's a part of me that'd be a little bit disappointed. Oh, oh, you coped without me. <laughs> oh, I, I obviously haven't made everything kind of reliant on me. Things go fine without me. Isn't that shocking? But there is a part of me that wants praise. It's a part of me that exalts in being depended upon through not sharing the load. And I wonder if anyone else here kind of resonates with that. Or am I alone in this uh, revelation of my faults? (laughs) Do you sometimes find it easier to go it alone? Or are you one of those people that finds it easy to share what it is that you need help with? I think most of us, right, most of us find it easier to go it alone, right? And there's a, there's a kind of self-sufficiency, doing stuff on your own is fine, 
right? If you're living a life where you're completely dependent on others, then maybe you're not living a kind of life that is sustainable over the long term. But there is a line between self-sufficiency and self-reliance. And it is a line, I believe, that we are tempted to cross all the time. We go from, yes, I'm managing, thanks, when, we're, when you're asked how you're going, you're like, yeah, I'm managing well, thank you very much. To kind of, I'm not really managing, uh, but I just need to try harder. I think some of us are in this place right now. Life is tough. We're struggling. Yet we keep pushing and we just keep pushing. We're wearing ourselves out and we never ask for help. Why do we do that? Maybe it's not something right now, but something you've seen as a pattern in your life is that you push yourself to the breaking point and at no point do you ask for help. And perhaps the reason for that is you think to yourself, I don't want to be a burden on anyone else. I don't want to burden anyone. Everyone has their own stuff to deal with. Nobody has an easy life. They don't need my stuff on top of what they're dealing with. Maybe, on the other hand, we don't think that our troubles are as bad as somebody else. Uh, They've got it so much harder. There are lots of people in the world who have things so much harder than I do. Why am I even complaining? Maybe we think that our problem is so small that it would be silly to ask for help with it. I should be able to manage this. But there's another reason why we might not ask for help and maybe a more sinister reason why we don't ask for help is that we don't want people to see how bad it is. We don't want people to see that we're not coping. We don't want people to see that we haven't had a prayer time in months that devotions have fallen off completely, that discipline of ourselves and our kids has nearly disappeared. A situation like that comes about because of, I believe, self-reliance and self-exaltation. Can we see how dangerous that those things are? And we see how they undermine our joy and our peace. But worst of all, they erode our confidence in the gospel. Because the gospel says that we can't rely on ourselves. The gospel says that we've got nothing that is in ourselves that is inherently worthy of being exalted. Self-reliance and self-exaltation is what got humanity into this mess in the first place. And that is where today's text comes in. This passage in Galatians 6 addresses the twin problems of self-exaltation and self-reliance. God knows our weakness is to go it alone, to be totally self-reliant, to tend towards self-exaltation. And so he gives us these commands. Verse 1 helps us to counteract self-exaltation with humility. Have a look at verse 1. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. Now, it uses an interesting phrase, caught in a sin. Caught in a sin. Uh, It indicates something that is serious, but not habitual. It's a moral failure, but it it has kind of snuck up on the individual. It's crept up on them. And there's a story of a guy who who was uh, an elder at a church, and one he just had confessed to the group that uh, one night he got drunk. He wasn't intending to do it. He didn't start out with that intention, but he just one drink led to another, and he had to confess to us that that's what had happened. It didn't happen again. He was caught in a sin. And those who are spiritual, the Bible says, should restore them gently. You see, we're imperfect people. We're caught unawares. We constantly fall short. And if a church were to come down like a ton of bricks on every infraction, no matter how slight it was, none of us would be left, right? None of us would be left. But that's where humility comes in. 
That's the reason we should restore people gently, because we too might be tempted. It's so easy, isn't it, to be, to be smug and self-righteous. Uh, this week I, got my, I did a test for Hebrew. I was talking to one of my classmates and he showed me his test and I'm like, aha, you've made a few mistakes, buddy. There's a mistake here and there's a mistake there. And then I said, oh, this last question, I did that completely differently. And what I meant by that was that I'd done it rightly and he'd done it wrongly. And he comes back and he says, oh, yeah, I did it another way too. And then I read the question again. And I'm like, what? And I read the question again. And what do you know? I misread the question and done the answer incorrectly. Now, I was smug and (laughs) self-righteous. It's very easy to be. And then he revealed to me that I was just as, um, (laughs) I failed just as much as he had. It's easy to point out the faults of others, but then extend oceans of grace to ourselves, even when we fall in exactly the same way. We look down our noses at the one who doesn't have the regular quiet time. But we'll be ready with all kinds of excuses why we haven't cracked our Bibles open in a month. Or why we haven't prayed for the lost in a year. Or that we've never shared our faith at all. Watch yourselves, the Bible says. Watch yourselves. Don't assume that you're too clever to not fall into the same trap as others. Don't think that your marriage is too strong to be tempted to break your vows. Don't think yourself too disciplined to give in to lust. The antidote to self-exaltation is the recognition that none of us are immune from sin. It's the recognition, but for the grace of God go I. But for the grace of God go I. I was thinking about this because of the story of Ravi Zacharias. Now some of you may have heard or you know Ravi Zacharias. Uh, He died, I think it was last year. And it came out after his death that not only was he a great apologist, but he was also a great abuser of women. Many women came out forward and said that he pressured them and used them sexually. It's tarnished his reputation. It's, it's horrible. It's a horrible thing. It was a horrible thing for these women. And the thing that kind of made it worse uh, was that apparently Ravi Zacharias would go to these women and say, if you come out, if you tell people about what we're doing, then it will ruin my ministry. And there are lots of people who came to faith through my ministry. You could, in effect, send people to hell if you tell people about what, I, what we're doing or what I've done. And we think to ourselves, gosh, I was like, that's a pretty extreme example. I mean, that's egregious sin. That's out of control, habitual sin. That must have been going on for years. But I tell you this morning, it didn't start there. It didn't start there. It started for Ravi, I am sure of this, much more subtly. It started with self reliance and self exaltation. Even in those words, if, you, if I fall, I will take many others with me. What self-exaltation, what self-reliance is that? You can bet that it started in a much smaller way. It started with not letting people in, not letting people see that he was struggling, and being so consumed with his public image that he didn't want to see how dry he had become in his faith. And friends... That's a thing that all of us have done. We've all tried to go it alone. But verse 2 tells us that this is not the the way of Christ. What does it say in verse 2? Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now in this verse I think we see a few amazing things, or at least two. Firstly... We see a recognition from God that we all have burdens. God recognises that there are seasons in our life that are hard. There are times when things are going smoothly. It's plain sailing, the breeze is caught in our our sails and everything seems to be going well. 
And then what happens? The winds change and all of a sudden the waves are choppy. And no matter how much effort we put in, we don't seem to be making any progress at all. And you know what? God understands. In fact, the Lord Jesus understands that life is hard intimately. You see, Jesus lived a perfect life, but he didn't live an easy life. Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus lived a hard life, often sleeping in the open, often being surrounded with people all hours of the day. Sometimes Jesus got so got sick of it, I think, and had to get off on his own in the wilderness to be on his own with God. Jesus knows what it is to have burdens in life. And this verse, verse 2, recognises that all of us have burdens. But the second thing it tells us, the antidote to self-reliance, is it tells us that we were never meant to carry them alone. We were never meant to carry them alone. Now later in verse 5, you might detect what seems a slight contradiction. Uh, Verse 5 says, For each one should carry his own load. But what it's saying in that verse is that uh, on Judgment Day, each one will have to give an account for themselves. It's talking about um, not comparing yourself to others. It says in verse 4, each one should test his own actions, then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to anyone else. It's saying on Judgment Day, you won't be able to point to that other person and say, well, I did better than them. Each one will have to carry his own load, in a sense, on Judgment Day. But verse 2 tells us that we weren't meant to carry the full burdens of life on our own. Self-reliance is not part of God's plan for us. Instead, it says we fulfill the law of Christ when we carry one another's burdens. And what's so interesting about this is that this phrase, the law of Christ, is unique. It only occurs once in the New Testament, and it's in this verse. Now, what's interesting about that, and maybe this is just a a Bible nerd thing, but the Galatian church had been rocked by false teachers False teachers had come in and said that if you want to be a real Christian, you can't just have faith in Jesus. No, no, that's not enough. You can't just have faith in Jesus. You need something extra. You need to be circumcised. Oh, yes. If you want to be a real Christian, you need to be circumcised. Oh, also, uh, you need to wash your hands in the correct way. Oh, also, you need to have the kind of clothes where you haven't mixed fibres. Also, you need to not work at all on the Sabbath, no matter how that impacts your family no matter what that means for you if you're a slave. If you want to be a real Christian, then you'll only eat certain types of food. See, they reasoned, these teachers came into the Galatian church and they said, God gave this law to to Moses, so it should apply to converts, not just the Jews. And maybe you can imagine a situation where you've come out from the world, you in a, in a culture in which... You were despised for becoming a Christian. You might have even lost your family members to become a Christian. You might have even lost a spouse in order to become a Christian. Could have lost your job. But you rejoiced at all that persecution because you thought, my sins have been forgiven. I found the way of life. And then to have these teachers come who say, no, no, no. It's not enough to just have faith in Jesus And they lay all these requirements on you, a burden that they themselves were not able to bear. But the gospel, the law of Christ, is the opposite of what those false teachers did. Do not increase your brother's burden by laying unbiblical laws on them. Do not weigh down a sister with man-made regulations. The Bible says, help them carry their burden. And when you do that, when you help someone carry their burden and not increase it, you fulfill the law. You fulfill the law. 
All of God's requirements are fulfilled in carrying somebody else's burden. How incredible is that? Because we're so, we've, we're so fast, we're so uh, intricately trying to figure out what does God want me to do? Is this right? Is this wrong? Uh, I'm part of a Facebook group and a very common question is, is it lawful to do X? Is it lawful to do X? Or why? Or is it lawful to smoke a pipe? Is it lawful to watch a movie on the Sunday? All these kinds of questions. But the Bible is so radical and simple. Help your brother or sister carry their burden. And you will fulfill the law. Isn't that precisely what Jesus said? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. On this, Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets. In another place, Jesus said, Do to others what you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. We get so tied up in trying to do the right thing that we fall into this trap of self-reliance and self-exaltation when the solution to the problem all along was bearing one another's burdens and in so doing, fulfilling the law of Christ. Now, don't let this slip by as just a nice thing to hear. I believe it requires us to do something. Because it's impossible to bear burdens when you can't see them. It's impossible to bear burdens that you don't know exist. If we don't know what is hard for someone, we don't know how to help. All of us have had that experience, uh, or we've done it ourselves, but we've had that experience where someone sends us a text message or something and says, if, or says to our face, if there's anything that I can do to help, let me know. All of us probably at some stage have heard someone say that to us. Nearly all of us have said that to somebody. And yet I can count on one hand the number of times that that person has come back to me and said, yes, actually, could you help me do this? And I'm sure many of our experiences are the same, is that you very rarely, of that open-ended uh, invitation for help, very rarely gets called upon. It's a nice thing to say, it's not a wrong thing to say. But it's not something that people take up. It's a genuine and well-meant offer, but people in difficulty are also low in energy. And sometimes the effort of sharing a problem seems like more work than just doing it themselves. So I have a different question that we can ask instead. Maybe a more probing one. By asking people, what's hard right now? What is hard right now? What saps you of strength? What in your life robs you of joy? What would it look like if God met your greatest need? And here's the challenge that when we're asked a question like that. is not to say nothing, I'm fine. Uh, sometimes when I ask people, well, how can I pray for you? And they say, there's nothing. I'm like, seriously, is your life going so well that there's nothing? Nothing I can pray for? Don't say, I'm fine. Often, that's just not true. It's just not true. We think, oh, there's someone with a greater need. But friends, if we're going to fulfill the law of Christ by bearing one another's burdens, we need to be willing to share them. We need to be willing to be vulnerable. We're going to need to be humble and admit that we don't have it all together. We might need to say, I don't have any idea how to handle my teenagers. We might need to say, I'm out of control with what I'm looking at on the web. We might need to say, I'm not coping with the demands of my job. 
Friends, if we can't say that, if we can't admit that we're imperfect, maybe it isn't because we don't want to be a burden on somebody else, but because we don't want to admit to somebody else that we have a burden. Self-reliance and self-exaltation are twin devils that deceive us by making us believe that we're doing just fine. And they break our backs by making us think that we can always carry our own burdens. But we defeat them when we admit that we have burdens and we have the courage to share them. And we have the love and intentionality to seek ways to help other people carry their burdens. God is calling us, I believe, to be a place where nobody has to walk alone. Right now, we have a lot of people that have high capacities, and yet um, that can be deceiving. That can be on the surface, things can look good. All of us here have things in our lives that are hard. Everyone has something that gets on top of us, that brings us down, that saps us of joy, and God is calling us to share it. And when we do that, when this church is a place where everyone's burdens are lightened because they are shared, well then I think that that will be something for which we will be known in the community. Now right now I don't think the Redeemer has a a massive footprint in the community. We're not well known. We don't have a prominent building, so we're not going to be known for anything except for the things that we do. And Carol's event might become a thing that we get known for over time. The service projects that are planned for youth might be something that we get known for. But imagine if the reputation of Redeemer Christian Church was this. That someone says, are you in trouble? Uh, Are you weighed down by life? Now those people in that meeting, that building, they're a bunch of weirdos. But if you need help, you go to Redeemer. A reputation that is for bearing one another's burdens being there for each other and for all who are in need. I've been reading through the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, you see the church doing that very thing. And at that time, the need in the church was money. There were people who didn't have enough money to live, who didn't have enough money to eat, didn't have enough money to put a roof over their heads. And so what did the Christians do? Well, their love for each other so overwhelmed them that they sold their property and gave to everybody who was in need. They were so willing to carry one another's burdens that they said, nothing of mine I will withhold from you if it would lighten your burden. Now, I don't know that that's exactly what God is requiring of us in that moment, but may our hearts be motivated by the same love for neighbour, the same love for one another that says, nothing of mine is too precious that I would not give it up for you. And by being authentic about our struggles and reaching out to help others with theirs, we defeat those twin evils of self-reliance and self-exaltation. And at the same time, we proclaim the gospel that Jesus died because we cannot make it on our own. That self-reliance is impossible because we cannot rely on ourselves to save us. We need to rely on Christ. We need Jesus. And God did not take us immediately to heaven the moment we believed. He left us here with a purpose. And while we are here, we need each other. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together around your word and ask that in your mercy that it would continue throughout the week to speak to our hearts. Help us, Father, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Father, may we not be so bound in self-reliance and self-exaltation that we cannot share what is heavy and what is hard And I pray that we wouldn't be so bound up in selfishness that we fail to ask 
and to reach out and help others. We pray, Father, for this help um, from your Holy Spirit, because that's the only way we ever change. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.